Ladies and gentlemen, this is part two of our interview with Jack Garfine. Now, part one took place many, many months ago, but here he is back in our studio. But there are 10 parts. There, there, are, there are so many parts to your <laughs> life, Jack, that it's amazing, that it is absolutely amazing, the different parts to your life, because your life... Uh, first, we had the, the part of uh, your young life where you were in concentration camps, 11 of them. And then now you come to the United States. How did you get to the United States from Europe? Did you? Oh, how did I get? Was it? Well, it's, it's quite a story. Yeah. Because, um, and I didn't understand some of it yeah. until, about, uh, until about four months ago. Oh, well, that's a little long yeah. in your life. When they were doing a documentary. Yeah. Because what happened was that first, because my father yeah. was one of the founders of Zionism mm -hmm. in, in, in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And he tried to warn the Jews to, to get out. And he also was in the underground mm -hmm. getting the Polish Jews through Turkey to Palestine, okay? Yeah. And my mother and he had later a terrible fight because she thought that he was thinking more about rescuing the Jews than his children and his family. Yeah. That he put all his energy in, in there. Yeah. yeah. And finally, had, well, what happened was um, I had a very happy childhood. Right. In a sense, well, well we kind of went through all that. What? We went through all oh, that we did. before. So, yeah. What I want to get to is we ended up with you getting out of the camps. You wound up in, uh, I think it was Sweden or Norway. Sweden. Yeah, yeah. Sweden? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm, uh, how did you get to the United States? Oh, okay. Okay. I got it. Yeah. So what happened was I had an uncle in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> it's very funny, but you now, know. Now, mind you, everybody... Uh, he, his family was wiped out in the camps, except for you. You were the sole survivor of your family, yeah, yeah, correct? Yeah, of my immediate family. Of your immediate family. Yeah. So you had an uncle in the United States. Yeah, I had an uncle in the United States. And he, he, what happened was I did a performance in Sweden. Did I tell you about that? No. So... Uh, I was one of the youngest. There was another boy my age, mm -hmm. a little younger, I think. And they were putting, he wanted to put on a kind of a show for the Swedish people mm -hmm. and the Swedish and all the embassies. Yeah. Outdoors was a nice place. He set up a stage. And I auditioned, auditioned. I, I went up and wanted to be in it. Right. And it was between me and the little boy. Uh -huh. And, uh, I got the part, which is the part of a, what's called a pupil who took care of the capo's house. He cleaned it, yeah. cleaned his shoes, and as a consequence, he didn't have to go out to work. Was this your first acting part? No, no. Uh, I, I, I had to act. And my father yeah. would put on shows oh, okay. about Zionism and all that. When you were a kid. But yeah. I had big fights with him Yeah. because... Uh, I kept, I remember the one time I kept, he kept trying to get me to be natural and easy, and I f felt like I was an actor. <laughs> and so uh, I would say, and the clouds, run over the trees, and the wind came. And my father would say, please, just say the word yeah. simply. Yeah. So I thought, okay. He kept arguing with me. I felt, okay. So in the preparation, in the rehearsal, yeah. I would do it his way, and everything yeah. was fine. Let's get to how you got you got to the United States. Your uncle brought you to the United States. Yeah, but it's yeah. connected. It's connected. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what happened was that that I did all that in the rehearsal, but then for the show. Yeah. Boy, I said, "Then the clouds went, and the twin came, and a big, and so, oh, and my sister who was in the show." Yeah. She listened to my father. She was very simple. So after the show, they said, oh, Yankush, that was my name. Yankush, you're the real actor. My sister, she's not, she, was just, she was just like here. No, just like yeah. a little girl. 
but you are really an actor. Yeah. And I got all my friends and all the people in me, the great actor. So during the show, what happened was that the uh, guy who played the capo mm -hmm. didn't this, do this. This was in Sweden. This was the play in, in Sweden. Sweden yeah, this is yeah. for the Swedish people yeah. to see us. It was a kind of a pageant show, you know. Yeah. And so uh, he didn't smoke during the rehearsals, you know. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly, during the show, he lights up a cigarette and it smokes. And at one point, he threw the cigarette away for a cigarette in a concentration camp. You could buy the Empire State Building, <laughs> right? So with my right foot, I pushed the cigarette to my sho other shoe, covered it with a cleaning, with a mm -hmm. cloth, and then stuck it into the shoe, right? And suddenly, because when that happened, that became so real to me. Yeah. You know, that I, this is what, right. I, what I did. And what happened was, when I, after, when I was leaving the exit, I got a big hand from the audience. So I thought, oh yeah, because I'm a kid, I went through the camps, that's why they're giving me a big hand. But when it came to the curtain calls, you know, everybody got a, me, woo, big hand. And I thought, well, again, because they're giving me a hand because I'm a kid, you know? Right. And went through the camp. Yeah. And so the, the guy from the American embassy, not the ambassador, but the second in charge, came up to me and said to me, uh, do you have any relatives in the United States? Well, you know, uh, uh, and where are they? So, you know, everybody had an uncle in the United States. Right, exactly. But I said, Yes, I have an uncle in Chicago. I didn't want to say New York. Everybody said New York, but it's Chicago. So he said, okay, well, this man, who's, by the way, card I have uh, somewhere, I still, I kept it. Uh, he went and took an ad in the Herald Tribune mm -hmm. that this boy who survived the camps is, you know, in Sweden in this and this town and uh, then a friend of my father's, mm -hmm. one of his best friends. Um, what do you need? Kleenex. A little Kleenex? Here, let me give it. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. There you go. Saw the ad. Yeah. And he went and got in touch with my uncle in New York yeah. and said, Yankush, that was my name, survived. And so. <laughs> My uncle, <laughs> not the nicest of people, right? <laughs> he made arrangements, supposedly, for me to come out to the United States. Yeah. And everybody envied me and in the camp, the other kids who were there. Yeah. Oh, you're going to America, and and you know, and uh, so I, uh, I sort of started also to have images of being, you know, in the United States because I was, f I was definitely wanted to go to Palestine mm -hmm. to fight for Israel, for right. the state. So, okay, uh, they arranged for me to get on a boat, the first five, among the first five people to come to the United States. And uh, because there was no passenger ship yet. Right. So this was a merchant ship, you know, mm -hmm. and there were five of us. And I used to, uh, go out and watch the waves and the sea. And, and then I found a book, a little notebook that I kept there in which I wrote down my father's birthday, my mother's, my sister's. I kept thinking about them. You know? Yeah. And, um, and so then I was looking forward to seeing the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. But what happened was there was a huge storm <laughs> in New York. <laughs> So we ended in Baltimore. Oh boy. And I got out in Baltimore. I saw all these black people. I thought we were in Africa. Yeah. Because I never, in New York, there was only one time when there was, a, not New York, in uh, Sweden. Yeah. In Göteborg. There was a rumor that there was a boat, American boat with black people. I had never seen any. 
So we rushed, like all the kids rushed to the thing, to look at to look at the black to people. look at black people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and then what happened was uh, there were three guys at a desk. There was no no uh, real setup. Uh, three guys at a desk. I said, "What's your name?" My name, Jakub Garfer. Jak, right? I wrote uh, Jack. They, <laughs> Jack. They said Jack, and I yeah. said, "Okay, Jack." And then they said, "Where are you going?" I said, "New York." My uncle. What's the address? River Cedar Drive. River Cedar Drive. <laughs> River Cedar so Drive. Yeah. So. Uh, Anyway, they said my uncle could, they, oh, there was a man from a higher yeah. there. And he said that my uncle couldn't come because of the snowstorm. So he was there for me and for the other three people as well, four people. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, and then he said, your uncle will meet you at 34th Street. Uh, this is a key point in my life which I didn't understand until about maybe six, seven months ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what happened was um, I arrived, oh, when I was on the bus, by the way, mm -hmm. I was a kid, I was 15, I ran to the back you know, window to see, to see the town. Mm -hmm. When the driver started to yell at me, yell, I didn't know what he was saying, but the guy from higher said, no, 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 you can't go there. That's black people only. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, from Auschwitz to this? To this, yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, what's going on here? Anyway, so I arrived at, at 34th Street Station. My uncle is there. He takes me to his apartment. Now, something... I have not understood about my life. I have felt constantly here in the United States a kind of a wall, no matter what, a hollowness mm -hmm. between me and the other people. And particularly, I felt the Jews who I felt should be close to me, mm -hmm. but except for individuals. Right. Generally speaking, I felt a distant, mm -hmm. you know. And I only understood that when I said, because the, the, the uh, French are doing a documentary on me. Yeah. And when I told them the story, they said, hey, could we go to that apartment, the first apartment where you came to? And I said, yes, I know where it is, but I don't know who's there. Might not there. be there anymore. The, so it was Yitzhak Perlman's apartment, and his son now had it. Oh, really? And when they asked him, he said, oh, I'd be delighted to see Jack Arvine. You yeah. Know? So anyway, yeah. I... Uh, I, I went there and I walked into the apartment and it wasn't, the rooms were the same, but things were changed. And he said, well, where, where were you? I said, well, I slept on the couch. He said, you slept on the couch? I said, yeah, well, it was only for a couple of months. Then they put me into a rooming house. Mm. And um, he said, put you in a rooming house. I was 15. Right? Yeah. And I said, yeah, that's, uh, and I suddenly understood something amazing. That, and then I understood the photographs. I have pictures when I'm in Sweden. I look great, heroic, because in Sweden, I was a kid who went to the camps and survived. Yeah. I was invited to dinners, to this. Yeah. Oh, it was great. I realized. When I arrived here at the railroad station, my uncle hugged me, he didn't even kiss me, you know? And I felt, now I understood it. Now I understood I was a refugee, see? Yeah. I wasn't the kid who did. Okay, how did you get from this to into the theater? What? Uh, how did you get from this point into the theater in New York? <laughs> because you were pretty young when you got into the theater yeah. in New York, right? Well, this is what happened. As I told you once, the Kafka story that I did, mm -hmm. where it says, the reason I did it because I found the epilogue, mm -hmm. which said that human beings are horrible. 
but not individuals. Humanity is terrible, but individuals very great. This is one of your favorite quotes. You yeah. have said oh, this to me life. time and time again, yeah. and I and I and I, it's a valuable statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because here too. Yeah. What happened was, there was a Jewish child care association, and uh, my uncle wanted to put me into a Hasidic yeshiva because they would pay the bill. I could sleep there, and at least I had the nerve to say, no, I'm not going there. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And so the Jewish child care, I made some speeches for the United Jewish Appeal, and I refused to take money. I said, whatever you pay, give it to the people, in Europe, to my friends in yeah. Europe, you know? And my uncle hated that. Yeah. felt I should take the money. Wait, wait, let's get, let's get you into the theater. Let's find out how yeah, this yeah, yeah. happened. Well, what happened was that uh, um, uh, is the Jewish Child Care Association said, uh, I told them I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. Jack, they tried to talk to me, Jack, please. You, okay, you can act, but you have to have a job. You have to go to a school where you can get a job so you can have work. I said, I, I know, but I want, I to, be an want to be an actor. So they, they were amazing. So they said, okay, the summer came up in 46, mm -hmm. right? And so they said, okay, you know what? We're going to send you to a summer camp with other kids. You put on a show, we'll come and see it. And then we'll decide what we, we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So I said, fine. So I sent me to a very nice camp. I learned how to play baseball. You saw I got the award. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I put on a show. I acted and directed it with other people. Mm -hmm. And um, they came up to see it, the boy. And... Uh, and after the show, they said, okay, we'll do whatever we can, Jack, to get you to go into the theater, right? Yeah. So they made an appointment for me with Mr. Strauss, who was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. Ah. And I had a meeting with him in, in his office. What does Wall he have to do with theater? What? Yeah. What, <laughs> what does he have to his do with Wall theater? Street, the office is half your apartment. Yeah. There. So he said to me, you're just talking to you, you're a very bright boy, but Jack, you have to have a job or a career, something you want to do aside from theater. You can do that on the side, but you have to go to a school and a place and concentrate. I said, no, Mr. Strauss, I, I want to be an actor. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. And I applied to the biggest dramatic school where Brando went and uh, uh, all the big Eli Wallach, big stars. And uh, they said to me that I applied for a scholarship. That was at the Actors Studio? No, no. Oh, no. Dramatic Workshop. Oh, really? Okay. Irvin Piscotter uh -huh. was the head of it. And I applied, and I knew I had to pay $1,200 for the first part. It's like 12000 today, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to Mr. Strauss, if you could know that I had to pay that, that I, if I didn't get the scholarship, I would have to pay that money, but I will repay it eventually, you know? Mm -hmm. He said, Jack, it's a question of repayment. I'm just concerned about your future. He's like, it's like this is kind of like um, a, a father who says to his son, you know, uh, no, uh, I I know you want to be in the theater, but yeah. you've got to do something that will make you a yeah, living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, f finally, he said, "All right." He called the secretary and he said, "Give Mr. Garfine a check for twelve hundred dollars, right?" And I said, "Mr. Strauss, I will repay it. Don't worry about repayment. Just do whatever you have to do." So. I audition, mm -hmm. and Piscotter sees my audition. He didn't know my background about the camp. Right. I get the scholarship. Wow. And I'm the youngest for that year, you mm -hmm. know. 
And so uh, I went and gave the check back. And Mr. Strauss said, no, no, keep it. Put it in the bank. It's your money. Mr. Strauss, please <laughs> help somebody else. Help some other kid in Europe who may need it to. I, yeah. I'm, I'm fine. And it's the first year. And he even said, well, if you have a problem the second year, you come to me. I said, I, 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 I hope I will not, but okay. Right. Thank you. And okay. So I got into the dramatic workshop. I was the youngest again. And uh, Piscato you know, was a great director and um, revolutionized the theater. And here, they didn't have anything to do with him. So he now, actually, now you say that there were people who had gone through this school, like people who had gone through this school, like Eli Wallach and Marlon yeah. Brando. Was that that was previous to you, right? right. You were saying Brando, yeah, and Eli Wallach yeah. and actors like that had gone through that studio previous to you, before so, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh no, uh, Eli was there. Oh, he was there. Brando, I only saw once, but you know. Yeah. And anyway, so. And all the teachers, mm -hmm. uh, Herbert Berghoff, Stella Adler. Oh, wow. They were all teaching there. They were on the staff. Piscata organized it with a new school. This is like going to the Harvard of drama. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And so what happened was that uh, um, I, did, I directed and I acted. And uh, some of the people never forgave me like Rod Steiger, who was in my class, mm -hmm. who every time I talked about when I was direct, uh, director, you stupid ass, you should have just stayed with acting. <laughs> Your performance in, in school was one of the best I've uh, ever seen, and others yeah. did the same. But I had, every time I would go out professionally trying to get a job as an actor, my accent. Mm -hmm. I had an accent, so I couldn't couldn't do it, you know. Right. And all my friends tried to say, fuck them, they just keep going, you know. But yeah. So anyway, what happened was, uh, at one point, Piscara did a fantastic production that he directed mm -hmm. called The Burning Bush. It was the story about, you know, the, the Hungarian aristocracy mm -hmm. had the libel, the blood libel, you know. Right. where they claimed that the Jews used uh, Christian blood to bake their matzahs, you know, and so there was a huge anti-Semitic thing, which of course finally, and they used a boy, a Hasidic boy, as a witness. Mm -hmm. So uh, Piscata cast me and another boy in the part. We alternated, you know, and um, it was a tremendous experience. So where did you where did you go from there? What was your next step? My next well, what happened was that the um, um, uh, next step. What happened was that, what, well, again, it's my theory which I keep saying to you. Here was a German anti-Nazi, right? Yeah. Who gave me my my future, right? My profession. Right. I'd go. That's what I mean. Individuals. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. So what happened is I, I did other shows there. And finally, um, there was an Israeli guy who was a director who was teaching at the YMHA in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he had to go back to Israel. And he comes and he recommends me to direct the show, to take over. Wow. You know? How old are you at this point? At this point, I'm 17, 18. Jeez. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So I go, I get paid, I direct one show after another. Some very good people who saw it, they were all, because the people who were there were not actors, they were, yeah. you know, just a club of. Right. And uh, I got got wonderful reviews and response and all that. And then an actor, Arthur Storch, who later became a director and actor, he uh, got a job as, a, as an actor. I think it was the Levittown Playhouse. Yeah. And he 
two, he came to me, asked me to direct the show. You know, I was 18. Yeah. He asked me to direct the show at Levittown. And so uh, I, I was surprised. I thought, okay, here are my kids, or why? But what is this? No, 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 Jack, you can do it. And it was John, I think John and Mary or something like that. Yeah. So I directed my first show. Wow. And, uh, and you're and then, 18 years old. Yeah. Then came the second year of the school. I didn't want to go and ask them for a scholarship again. But there was a guy in town called Joe Wallhandler. He later became a big press agent, right. handled Marilyn Monroe, Kazan. I introduced him, but he was a, sol uh, a conscientious objector during the war. Mm -hmm. And he volunteered to go into Bergen-Belsen, where there was a typhus epidemic, yeah. know, to show that he's, not, that he's doing something, right. you know, taking a risk with his life. Right. So um, he was the... the um, manager of the Paris Theatre, which had just opened, and was showing Laurence Olivier, Henry V. Mm -hmm. And I went to Joe, who I became close to, really, and I said, Joe, this is my situation. You know, I need to find uh, uh, $1,200. Yeah. So he came up with an idea. He went to the projectionist, told him the story, and they and Joe said, "Look, all the all the big shots of United Artists on the weekend, they're in their Long Island, they're in their homes in Fire Island. Nobody's here except you and I." And he said, "In the morning on Sunday, before we open for the matinee, why don't we have a showing of Henry V for a group of kids, a school?" And this boy can get his money to go his second year. Yeah. So he went to the dramatic workshop, told him, I have a screening for you Sunday morning. Your entire school can come, 300 students. They said, great. And they gave me the second year scholarship. Uh, okay. When I met Laurence Olivier, who became a great fan because of my first film, and I told him the story, he said, well, Jack, Another good reason for having done Henry V. <laughs> <laughs> so you you have this um, school that you're going to, the yeah. School of Dramatic Arts, it's called? What dramatic Workshop. The D Dramatic Workshop. And you pay for the second year, okay, yeah. and you're on your way. Now, how did you get from that to your full Broadway directing and your... Time at the actor's studio. Well, also when I was in school, I had a job as an usher at the Lowest Theater. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, and and uh, and as a package boy. Yeah. First uh, at the Beacon Hotel, mm -hmm. which is still there. Right? right. I had a job as a, as a package boy, any packages that came in. Yeah. Right. And I loved it because I was sitting there for hours. I read Shakespeare, Bacon, you know, all the great writers. But one day the head usher <laughs> came in and he saw me reading Shakespeare. What? Don't tell me you're an actor. You told me you were interested in accounting and you want to be an accountant. And he fired me. <laughs> he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't want actors to have a job. Uh. So anyway, so I was out of a job, but then I got the usher's job. And the head guy there tried to discourage me from being an actor. Every, everybody, nobody wants you to be an actor. They're all, they're right? all nobody, nobody wants you to be an actor. Everybody's trying to discourage you from being no, an yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah. But you were single purpose. Ex you knew exactly what you except wanted. Except Piscata. Yeah. Said you were a great director. Well, he gave me the scholarship. I'm sure if I had gone back for the second year, he would have done it again, you know. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Uh, you know the actor who was in the Billy Wilder movie with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, 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 his original name was Bernie Schwartz. Oh, oh, you mean Tony Curtis? What? Tony Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. So Tony Curtis was invited to Berlin. Yeah. To deliver the eulogy 
or for Biscara when he died. Mm -hmm. So he talked about the influence of what Biscara did, but he said, but I'm telling you something. The memory that stays with me all the time is when I saw this gray-haired man in his late 60s walking down 48th Street right. with his arm around the boy, 18, who had gone through 11 camps. So did you get a second year scholarship to the school? I didn't need to uh, the, because of the screening. Joe Wall had let arrange. Oh, okay. So you got the money to do yeah. the second year. Yeah, yeah. So when did you break away from there? And and well, I graduated. Mm -hmm. Right. They misspelled my name on the graduation. <laughs> it's Garfin instead of Garfine. <laughs> yeah. And um, what happened was that uh, I got a job as a package boy, usher, all that. Yeah. And um, then a guy who was with me, oh yeah, then the American Theater Wing. Yeah. I uh, uh, I got, but oh, I know a very important story. Okay. Yeah. So what happened was Strasburg was organizing. Now, this is this is Lee Strasburg. Yeah. Uh, of the uh, uh, of, of the actor's studio. It, it was, he wasn't yet in the It wasn't yet the actor's yeah. studio. It, but. Actor's studio was there, but he wasn't a part of it. Right. And um, he said he was organizing a class at the American Theater Wing mm -hmm. for directing. That 20, maybe 25, no, I think it was 30 people could apply and, uh, and do their, show him their scenes. And after that, he would organize the first directing class in New York mm -hmm. with 10 people, okay? Right. So I had done scenes with actors. I went and I did, uh, can't think of the title of the book now, uh, a scene from book mm -hmm. and, and I did it. And then when the term was over, he was gonna choose 10 people. Most were GIs, the, the GI Bill right. was paying. <clears throat> right. And uh, I was again on a scholarship, you know. Yeah. So um, after I did my scene with the other actors, I didn't hear anything. So I thought, okay, fuck. So my friend said, call them up and find out, you know. And so, uh, and then he, uh, he was already, that's when he, the year he became a kind of a teacher at the actor studio, and I wasn't a founder, you know. Yeah. So uh, what happened was uh, I got to the actor studio, and I now saw let, let me say to people so they they know because a lot of people don't know this. Yeah. The actor studio at that time became almost the focal point. Yeah. For well, all the big the actors actor of studio the time. Was founded by Kazan. Yeah. Danny Mann, Ilya Kazan, and Cheryl Crawford. Yeah, and the idea was, you didn't have to pay any fees. That what he said, Kazan said, I wanted it to be a place where the actors got out of the rain. <laughs> right? And it's true because outside, like today, yeah, they've been cast for type for this, not as artists or not as people who can make a contribution. Right, and so and he wanted a place for that to be. And so uh, when I went to see him, oh no, excuse me. So the class at the American Theater Wing was over. My friends asked me to call, I didn't hear anything. Call, find out. So uh, I had the courage finally and, and I called mm -hmm. and I said, uh, I just want, I haven't heard, I just wanna know if I passed uh, my name is Jack Garfine. Yes, Mr. Garfine, you passed. So when does the directing class start? It doesn't start, Mr. Garfine. You're the only one that passed. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. And so then, then uh, how did you get to the actor's studio? So what happened was I then went to see Strasbourg when he became part of the actor's ah, studio. Ah, okay. A couple right. of years later. Yeah. And I, I said, uh, what about 
I'd like to also be a part of it. He said, Jack, you have to direct the production. And after you direct the production, mm -hmm. we'll come and see it and then become part of the actor's studio. So what happened was a guy who was in my class at the theater wing yeah. became a director at NBC on the Kate Smith show. And they decided to do dramatic segments with all the exciting young actors. And, um, and so he, uh, he again uh, recommended me to, to direct, you know. I, oh, I was, that's when I had my job as, um, as a package boy. As a package boy. Yeah. And now they want you so to direct, get, wait a minute, let no, me no, get no, the, let me. No, what happened no. was, is he said, called me up and he said, uh, Jack, uh, I talked about you to the producer, to Barry Wood, mm -hmm. and uh, do you think you could do the scene that you did there at this place? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, because, oh, because what I did was to, to get attention and money, all the actors were in their 40s, their 30s. Yeah. I was the director, right? <laughs> so they, uh, I said that if they wanted, me, I could do a scene at a party when I had guests, I would ask the actors to do it. Yeah. And the actors first thought I was nuts. I said, well, listen, we're not going to get paid, but we're going to eat well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we did. And, and then they asked me to do a scene. And after that, people came to me and said, could you do it at my party? And they paid some money. And the actors were amazed, right? And so he got Barry Wood to see it. And he asked, Barry Wood asked me, would I bring it in to the studio where he yeah. would see it? But first he wanted to talk to me. Yeah. So I came in and talked to him. He said to me, um, so uh, how did you, I said, how I got the actors. I told him how I worked with them. And he said, well, okay, so. I want you to do this on the audition night when they do Kate Smith show. They had acrobats, jugglers, you know. Oh, oh, the book is Darkness at Noon. Yeah. About the communist regime. Right. Yeah. And I'm there, and they ask me, "What are you doing?" I said, "Darkness at Noon." How, what do you mean? What happens? The lights go out at noon, you know, because this wasn't a dramatic show, you know. Right. And so I did Darkness at Noon, and the scene. And I was asked to come in and see Barry Wood. So I thought, okay, he's going to give me a job as an assistant. I'm a kid. He's going to give me a job as a assistant stage manager or coffee boy. I, so I ignored it. Two weeks later, the secretary calls me and says, Mr. Garfield, we don't understand. Why don't you want to come in and see Mr. Wood? Oh, I'm sorry, I lied. I said, I was busy, I'm working, <laughs> you know. Okay, so she gave me a date. So I went to see Barry Wood, and uh, I felt, uh, okay, I see, but I know nothing's going to come of it. You don't want to be a male boy. Yeah. And Barry Wood said, said to me, listen, I'm very impressed with what you did. Let me ask you something. Do you think you could direct uh, small segments on a television show? And of course, I never even got near a television show. Right. Of course, I said, I can direct it. He said, well, the idea is all the young actors on Broadway, Barry Nelson, Phyllis Lowe, Donald Buca, who were, you know, big coming up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do a series with them. Do you think you could handle it? Sure. I said, no problem. <laughs> so he said, okay, go ahead and talk to the manager. The you know, produce, not the producer, but the manager of the mm -hmm. thing. So I go in and the guy says to me, oh, Mr. Wood is very impressed with you. So it's a weekly show, mm -hmm. you, but every two weeks, so you have a week to prepare it right. and then you can do it. Now when you say directing, uh, were you literally directing the show? In other words, were you calling the camera shots yeah, and everything? everything. So you were becoming a full-fledged yeah, television no, I producer. I worked with the script. I worked yeah. on the script, and then I, the setting, I, I directed it. Yeah. 
So he said to me, uh, the manager said, so what about, you have an agent? I said, no, no, I don't have an agent. So what, uh, what would it cost to have you work for us to do a show? Well, I was making $35 a week mm -hmm. at the hotel. Yeah. So I thought, well, what about $70 a week? Oh, boy. <laughs> the guy said, $70 a week? Yeah. Okay, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was saving several hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what happened was that uh, I did the first show with Donald Buca. Mm -hmm. A critic in the Daily News said, I have not seen acting like this since the poetic realism of the group theater. Mm, wow. You know, and so I said, oh, great for me. Now I can go to see Strasbourg. <laughs> I mean, who yeah. the hell ever got a review like that? Exactly. So I went to the actor's studio, I waited until they broke, and he came out and said, sorry to disturb you, Mr. Strasbourg, but I need to talk. Oh, how are you? I said, I'm okay. I said, well, look, I directed this show. I want you to see the review. This is what the critic said. And Strasbourg looked and said, oh, it's very nice. well, Jack, to be a member of the actor's studio, we are not all actors, there were no directors, only actors. As a director, you have to do a show in a small theater somewhere with professional actors. Well, you already work with professional, I mean, with actors, and then I'll come and see it. And so I said, okay. So I was submitted a show to Equity Library Theater, but they weren't too crazy about it, but they had a problem with the production that they did want to do called mm -hmm. Camille, based on the book. Right. And uh, they said that they had a difficulty with that and uh, uh, it's not cast yet, so it's open. Uh, would you be interested in doing that? And I said, well, I have to reread it, but yes, I'm interested, I want to do it. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about it, because I felt it. Yeah. What a chance. This is your audition for Strasbourg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so I cast it and got a, a great designer, very famous. He's still working. Um, he did Tea House of the August Moon. Was, and so Peter, Peter uh, Larkin. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so, what happened was, uh, I cast it well and mm -hmm. rehearsed it, did what things with it, and so now came opening night. I invited Strasbourg. Yeah. And Strasbourg shows up with John Gassner. Who's Remember Ga John Gassner? No, I don't. Don't. The editor of of plays, books on plays, uh -huh. and a, also a lecturer on the mm -hmm. theater very important in those yeah. days. And uh, I put myself in a position in the theater where I could watch their reactions, right? Mm -hmm. And what, I was all of 19 then, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched, and then during the intermission, I, I, I started to walk out when Strasbourg is looking for me. Yeah. So I. I go up and I think, oh, why? He said, uh, okay, uh, we'll talk about it sometime and see. And then he left with Gassner after the first act, or se after the second act, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, fuck the actor studio. It's another a failure. A failure. Right. So uh, I never heard anything from Strasbourg the studio. And again, like it happened with this thing, my friends urged me to call. Yeah, give him a call. I didn't have the nerve, but finally I called. And I said, excuse me, uh, my name is Jack Garfer. Mr. Garfer, we don't have a number. We can't call you anyway. Oh. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Strasberg said you can attend the actor's studio. Wow. Now, there you are, you're at the oh, end. No, then yeah. a revolution with, my, with the acting. Oh, boy. Because what happened was they had scenes that they did, but they never did a production. Nothing came out of the studio except individual actors who would be cast, and people would say, wow, 
particularly in Kazan's productions. Yeah. Okay? Oh, and I had this incident with Kazan. So what happened was uh, I went and I found a play because everyone rejected it. And I happened to be invited by this uh, photographer. And they, at that time, uh, stereos, hi-fi just came out. Yeah, right. And he had a great hi-fi, so you could hear the music, like couldn't hear it. Right. And I, I was, you know, so I would go for those evenings. Mm -hmm. And one evening, I met uh, Calder Willingham. Right. Great and, playwright. Uh, he told me that he wrote this play, everybody turned it down, nobody wants to do it. So I said, well, could I ha read it? And he said, yes, under one condition, don't call me unless you're doing, a, I have a production, but I don't want to have conferences, meetings about the script, That's for, I've been going through all this, I don't want that. Just let me read it, okay? So I went and tried to cast it. And of course, they are not, no, 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 all the actors, Eli Wallach. Now, who are some of the actors that the actors do? What? When you were going to the actors yeah. studio in the beginning, who were some of the actors who were there? I, I, a lot of them, I forgot the name. Um, Walter Matthau, uh, uh, Brando was no longer there. He would come once in a while yeah. just to watch. Uh, Annie Jackson. Um, almost all really big who became who were big stars later you know yeah I can't think of all the names right now I think I'll, right and um, Mike Gazzo you Mike know Gazzo yeah, who was uh, like hat full of rain yeah and yeah. yeah but what happened was that I would go up to these actors saying I, I'm going to do a play I'd like you to cast you in them this kid's gonna do a play and I'm gonna be like, eh. there was nothing to do with me. So I went to all the young actors who just came in that nobody was interested in. Yeah. James Dean, uh, <laughs> uh, Ben Gazzara, George, not George Pepper, Ben Gazzara, um, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, I know. have the same problem. So uh, they, they uh, I went to them, and, and I got them together at the meeting. All, all these well, you were the first person. You said you actually kind of discovered James Dean, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. this was the first thing he had yeah, ever yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, I got them all together, mm -hmm. and I said, now look, I want to work on this play, but I'm not going to do it equity way. Three weeks of rehearsal, or you have dates, you can't make it. I'm sorry. You're gonna have to work with me every time, and I'll only show it when I feel it's ready. Show it. Nobody shows anything in the actor's studio, any full plays. They do scenes. People are going to kill us. I said, I don't care. Then not a part of it. But I'm doing do something that's never been done, okay? I want to do a production developed at the actor studio and done for actor studio members with Strasbourg people there like that. And uh, finally, they all agreed. I said, well, when are we gonna do it? I know you have jobs. Some of you may even get parts in a place somewhere mm -hmm. or an extra, whatever. Right. So we're gonna rehearse in the evening. So it'll be from about nine o'clock until midnight or 11.30 or 8.30, I said. Yeah, you know. right. And uh, they all agreed. He said, fine, we'll do it, Jack. And I told them what parts, cast, and we had the first reading, and they got very excited by the way I talked to them, what I said. So then, uh, one night, we were rehearsing on the seventh floor of the Anta building, and New York wasn't as dangerous then as it is today, but still, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. yeah. So I may always make sure the doors were locked and safe. So one night as we're rehearsing, guess what? What? We hear footsteps coming up the stairs. 
Oh, Pat Hengel was one of the people. Mm -hmm. All another, of them another great actor. First the acting time. job. Really? Well, yeah. Pat Hingle, Pat Hingle, in case people don't know, was a very, very accomplished actor. And if I... Well, if the I, first time Kazan saw him. And, and people have seen him, but they're one of the, he's one of those people that they go, wasn't he that guy that was in that thing? You know. But anyway, so go ahead. So we hear footsteps. Pat was the last one to come in. We said, what the fuck? You didn't lock the door. I did. I made sure... Come on, nobody else has a key to come in at this hour. What the fuck? Steps closer. Jimmy Dean grabs a chair, right? Yeah. Ben Gazzaro grabs another one, right? <laughs> and they get to either side. We're quiet. Yeah. The door opens. It's Ilya Kazan. <laughs> so he says, what, what are you guys doing here? So I introduced myself as a director. I said that. My name is Jay, I'm a director. And he, he looked at me like this kid. This is, kid know, is a director. director. Yeah. And, I, and he said, so what, what are you doing here? And I explained that most of us have jobs during the day. I'm, I'm working at Lois Theater and all that. But we meet at night. There's a project that I'm working on that I'm, I'm rehearsing every night, you know. Mm -hmm. And Kazan said, and you walk up seven flights every night, yeah, every night. He said, well, all I can say to you, and I introduced Pat Hengel, James mm -hmm. Dean, everybody. He didn't know anybody. And he looked and he said, all I can say is, you come and rehearse every night, and you walk up seven flights. I'm going to predict something. Each one of you are going to make an important contribution to film and the theater. And how long were you at the Actors Studio here in New York? How, in New York? Yeah. Uh, I think until the 60s. Yeah, and the, so that would comprise how many years from the time you started with them? So, uh, 15. Yeah. Yeah. So you worked your way up from, uh, you, you originally went in as an actor because that's what the Actors Studio did. And yeah, then yeah, you but, but I couldn't, I had an accent I couldn't do. But what happened was that the actor's studio was famous for the individual actors and performances. Yeah. But there was never a total project yeah. that was developed. At the and you studio. created the first total so project. So I did this play by Calder Willingham, and as a Man. Yeah. And what happened was that by the... Uh, um, I, they kept pressuring me, mm -hmm. are we going to do it? They got frightened because it's never been done before. Yeah. And I said, no, no, you're not going to do it until I feel that it's ready. Yeah. So I rehearsed for months. Yeah. You know, and had every part was worked on very specifically. Right. And they gave up jobs at night. They, yeah. They really devoted their time yeah. to it. Well, the time finally came and I put on the show. It was the first time a complete show was developed at the actor's studio. So um, the people who saw it, even the actor's studio people, like I remember Alan Schneider saying, I've directed Broadway shows, Jack, but what you have achieved here is something amazing in yeah. terms of the acting, the ensemble work. Right. And then what happened was, is that Ben Gazzara, a lot of the people, felt we should go and find a theater and do it in a small theater. But the point was there was no, at that time, there was no, you didn't work on a play off Broadway that moved to Broadway. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. That didn't happen in 24 years since O'Neill's play, 24 years or 25 years yeah, before. Okay. But after that, and so when we did that, uh, ben Gazzara was particularly anxious, kept pushing me to do something, to get people that I knew to put up the money and, you know. And so, um, and what happened was that Strasberg, who was remarkable about recognizing talent. Right. And encouraging it and sometimes discouraging, but, but remarkable in recognizing talent, but never would do a production unless there were names attached to uh -huh. it, you okay. know? 
like when he did a Chekhov, he had Kim Stanley, Geraldine Page, but never unknown actors, you know. Right. So finally, uh, uh, a girl I went to, to the dramatic workshop with came to see it, and she sort of fell in love with one of the boys, and she said to me that she just got an inheritance from her grandmother, and she would give me the money to do the show. So I went in to production at the Theater de Lis, and of course- Was this Broadway? Off-Broadway. This little, was Off-Broadway. Little, little okay. theater, yeah. Off-Broadway, and uh, because that they did, but, and I did it Off-Broadway and uh, at this little theater, and of course the critics came, and the reviews were something fantastic. And even the, uh, one of the greatest critics, Stark Young said, it was superior to any acting done, you know. And Strasbourg got so upset that he wrote to him and said, superior than the group theater? And Stark, I have the letter, Stark Young replied and said, uh, yes, the group theater actors were good, but they had one patch too many. <laughs> I said, these actors didn't, you know. Yeah. So it was it. But Strasbourg didn't come to the opening because he was terrified that it would wreck, the, uh, we would talk about the actor's studio and wreck it because it didn't have any stars in it. Who were these actors, right? Right. So he didn't show up. So Ben Gazzara, about four or five months, no, about a year or two before he died, he was on a program with me and I said to him, well, I have news for you, Ben. Do you remember the opening? Yeah. Do you remember the telegram from Lee Strasberg? Yeah. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it from Lee. I'm so sorry. I knew what that would mean to them that he didn't show up. Yeah. They was unable to do it. And that, you know, and so finally what happened was the reviews were so fantastic that again, this time we raised the money. Mm -hmm. Claire didn't have to put up all the money. And we moved it to Broadway. Yeah. It was the first one. Didn't you eventually make this into? A, didn't you eventually make this into a movie? After the, the, didn't it become the no, strange? No, one? What happened was, yeah. So it opened on Broadway, great reviews, and then, um, oh, uh, three or four years later, uh, Kazan always, Kazan was wonderful. He, he really saw the importance of it, and, yeah. And even when he, at the studio, you know, and. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, after On the Waterfront, yeah. Spiegel wanted to do a film, another film, and he asked Kazan about this production, which was then running on Broadway, and said, listen, this will be a great film. And Kazan said to him, the best director for this film is Jack Garfrey. And Spiegel said, what, the kid? <laughs> the kid? And he said, the kid, he never made a movie before. What, what are you talking about? I said, I know, he never made a movie. He's the best director for this film. And so, and he said, and I'll, I'll be there if you need any help, you know. Yeah. And so Spiegel decided to go along, and Kazan got this great cameraman to agree to film it, you know. And, um, and the film became the strange one, right? The film became the strange again. Willingham later was so upset because what happened was Spiegel sent out a questionnaire to the entire staff of, of Columbia Pictures, what's the best title for this film? And they wrote down what the majority said, the strange one. Yeah. You know, and Willingham said, if I had known that, I never would have let him do the film, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so then there was the problem with censorship you know, because to me, I didn't think of of the guy as you know doing a film about a gay person, because this was a real relationship, in the sense he admired the, the character of Gazara, mm -hmm. you know, really a real a real caring love for him, right. you know, and I, I wasn't going to go for the cliche, you know, about the feminine. If he's effeminate, he's going to behave a certain way, you know, and. Uh, and so he decided, Spiegel 
decided to do the film, but James Dean got in touch with Spiegel and said, listen, he was already a star then. Right. I want to make that film. I'll be better than Ben Gazzara. And Spiegel said to me, hey, Dean would like to do the movie. I said, I'm crazy about Dean. We're close friends. He's not right for that film like Ben Gazzara is, right? Right. And so I said, and anyway, so uh, then it opened. And at that point, at that point, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you you say Dean was already a kind of a major star. Yeah. And so that would have been something to have him be in the film. It would have drawn a lot of attention. Oh no, to the film. He, he, he was. Spiegel thought I was crazy. Yeah. Because most of the producers only think of money and names, not about talent. Very rarely. Yeah. About talent. How know? did how did how did how did Dean feel about you rejecting him for the Who? part? How did James Dean feel about no, you? No, he rejecting? knew I rejected him before. Oh, we were, we were very close friends. You so know? you could reject him and get away with yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What kind so, of what kind of person was what, what? he? What, what kind of person was he? Because all we have today is an iconic uh, uh, look of James Dean in our minds, but uh, there was a real person there that you had to work with. How was yeah, that? Yeah, there was a real person. Uh, one incident, <laughs> somebody in the actor's studio said that as far as improvisation goes, Jack Garfine is the best. Yeah. Nobody yeah. can do improvisations the way he does them and uses them. So after the session, this, you know, this, he said this in front of Strasbourg, you know. We went out, this is before he became a star, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, well, Jack, that was really great. But listen, it's something I have to tell you, I have to share with you, which is uh, the kind of death I have to face about my father. But you know, he got very upset. I said, oh, come on, Jimmy, it happens. Look what happened to me, you know. And then I put my arm around him and walked him to the hotel room. And he said, thanks, Jack. And then he looked at me and he said, how was that for an improvisation? <laughs> <laughs> and ran upstairs. Yeah. And I ran after him. And he locked the door so I couldn't. Now, how far into it, from the production of uh, uh, the Willingham play and the production of the movie was about four years, you say, the time between the two? No, about three years. About three years. So after three years, you were directing Hollywood films now. Yeah. Yeah. So then... And how old were you then? Probably 24 what? or something like that? What? Yeah, yeah. I was 25. Probably the youngest director in Hollywood. Yeah. But also, in between, I met Carol. Uh, that would be your, your wife. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, we should mention that, that it was Carol Baker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Carol Baker was, uh, Jack, uh, and I got to say, you must have been quite a winner because she had the, the uh, uh, reputation because of Baby Doll yeah. of being like a major sex symbol in America because everybody remembers her lying in that, Baby crib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, what happened was uh, I had a difficult time because she was married when she was 19 or 20 to a guy who was actually a gangster. Yeah. And, you know, she, made, she was a dancer in, 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 the, in the club, a famous club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he met her there. And then... Uh, uh, when I told you about it, we went to this photographer's place to listen to the stereo and the hi-fi. Right, right. A guy called Strasburg, not related to the other guy, but he was a friend, yeah. he knew them. And he said, Jack, I know uh, a guy, and he's married to this young girl who, you know, is interested in acting, and, uh, and I'd love to, you know, help out if I could arrange a meeting between the two of you, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, sure, why not? But I said, it has to be work. I didn't want any. Uh -huh. yeah. So I said, tell us you can do a scene for me. 
and now Vereshi will do it, and I'll go and watch it. So he calls me a week later. She's got a scene, and in this place, you'd like to see it, she will show it to you. So I went there, and um, she did from some very conventional movie mm -hmm. a scene, but I felt, ooh, not bad. You know, even though the material wasn't too hot. Right. I was, I said, you know, and I said to her, and I suggested that she study with Strasbourg, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, so she then uh, called me the next time and wanted to have lunch with me, and I said, okay, so we met in the Russian tea room, and she told me that she's unhappy with her husband, that they're probably heading for a divorce, but so she might not be around, she might have to go to Mexico, or them. and I said, okay, but, uh, so uh, the next thing, I think it's about a couple of months later, she called me, she said, well, uh, I'm going to Mexico, I'm divorcing my, my husband. So I said, well, I hope all goes well. I was into some more, the Strasbourg class, very exciting, it's wonderful, you know. And, uh, and then she came back, and I was with Peter Larkin at, at a cafe in the village. She called me, she said, well, I have, I'm divorced, I'm alone now. I said, well, you want to have a drink with us? <laughs> so she came down, we had a drink. Yeah. And then I started to go out with her and started to feel that she had real potential, you know. And the husband arranged for me to be beaten up. And I went to the police and detectives and then... Uh, they broke into my apartment, you know, and uh, she tried to talk to me. She said, look, we're divorced. What do you want? You know, but he had a lot of power. Yeah. You know, the police, uh, when I went and reported the police, the guy said to me, well, why do you fuck around with someone else's wife? How the hell did he know that? So I must have been told. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so um, what happened was that Kazan heard about it got terribly concerned and called me in and said, listen, uh, uh, some of the guys that are protecting me and on the waterfront, mm -hmm. I'll let them protect you, Jack. I said, come on, I faced bigger and stronger guys than that. I'm gonna get worried about this. And when he heard later that I was beaten up on the street, he insisted on having someone protect me. And I said, come on. I, who are these guys next to the guys who tried to do what they did to me? So you know what he did? Well, you know? Because everybody thinks badly of him in many ways. Yeah. He called the district attorney and told him the story. And the district attorney said, listen, I, can't, I have to have an incident that's to occur. I can't just go to a guy, uh, arrest him or do something. And, and Kazan supposedly said to him, well, don't do anything. You'll have to face, when this kid gets beaten up on the street after the concentration camps, your career is done, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, he arranged, the district attorney arranged to have a hearing, but he staged it with camera people, with so-called news people there, mm -hmm. just to ask questions. Well. He, uh, her ex got so f terrified <laughs> that they will get at real things with him, you know. Yeah. He just wanted to know about the questions. That after that, he left me alone. I was okay, all right? Wow. And when I saw Kazan, I said, gee, God, you really helped me. He said, yeah, but I feel badly for you. Why, what's wrong? The story is such a cliche, you won't be able to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, so she became your she became your wife. Yeah. But I, I want to backtrack a little bit because you you, you talk the, about your I want to backtrack just a little no, bit. No, but let me just say one yeah. thing. So at one point, Kazan asked me. Um, yeah, I think I was I married. If I wasn't married, it was just before we got married. Uh, yeah, maybe I was married. Coming out of the actor studio, he said. Yeah, he said, what do you think about your wife? What kind of actress do you think she is? I said, 
I hope you don't use her because I want to use her. He said, that's good enough for me, Jack. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> and so he arranged for her to read Baby Doll <laughs> at Tennessee at Williams' apartment with Carl Molden and Eli Wallach. How did you feel that at that moment, Carol Baker was the sexual icon of the moment because of that, of that poster, just on, on the yeah. poster for the movie? And if nobody's seen the poster for the movie, uh, I'm sure you can go online and see it. How did you feel? You were her husband, and you're the guy who's got her. Well, I was, <laughs> I was ambitious, and I thought my plan was, when I saw that happening, I thought, okay, I deserve it, because I saw this, recommended her, this yeah. the studio, and I said, I deserve it, so I can do what I've always wanted to do with her getting attention, that's how selfish that was. I said, I can get for my company, movie company, yeah. have the yeah. money to do the films I want to do. I want you to tell a story to the audience uh, uh, because you were talking about James Dean, yeah. being very close with James Dean. And you were, the, you were in Hollywood the day he died and you have memories of that, of finding out about it. You said you saw him earlier in the day, first of all, I with his car? I was the last car. person to see him. He was in his car taking off? No, even before. We were so close. Yeah. We were so close because we were going to do a, a Russian play mm -hmm. on Broadway. A, yeah. A play by, um, I can't, again. Yeah. The, anyway, the, Cheryl Crawford was going to produce it. Yeah. And everything was set up, and I went to... Hollywood, it was the last day of shooting of uh, Giant. Mm -hmm. And I went to the, his dressing room to tell him about the dates and what's happening. And uh, the Warner Brothers man came in and did his, you, you know, uh, clerical questions. Where is this? Where is that? And I saw Dean getting like that. So when he left, I said, hey, Jimmy, how oh, let people get upset? What are the clerical? That's their stuff. Yeah, but, you know, they, they treat me like a star, like an actor, but then they treat me like I'm occupying a space or something. Yeah. yeah. It was very upset. So I said, okay, Jimmy, so we meet in, in New York with Cheryl, mm -hmm. and we try to work out a, a date for the production. So I'm all excited about it, Jack. So where are you, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm... I'm just gonna go to the races. I said, Jimmy, please, what are you going to the races for? We have something planned we're gonna do. I don't want any her, any, any problems you know, for you to get into or anything like that. Jack, I'm not racing. I'm just gonna go to the races, okay? Mm -hmm. I promise you, I'm not gonna race, okay? So I'm just gonna do that. And uh, I said, okay, so you're just going to go to the races, yeah. Okay, so I left, we kissed, you know. And, and then I'm at the, at the Chateau Marmont, and it's uh, late afternoon, no, no, early afternoon, excuse me. And, or maybe morning, morning. Yeah. And as I go out of the Chateau Marmont, I see a whole crowd of people standing around, so I go to look. And I say, look, I say, what's going on? Oh, Jimmy Dean is in there. This is his car, and it's a racing car. I said, Jimmy Dean? Yeah. So I stopped by the car. He came out. It was wonderful. He saw me. He turned around and started to walk the other way. <laughs> I said, come on. What's going on here? Jack, I'm just going, I'm not going to race. But what's the car? I like to ride in a fast car, but I'm just going to go to watch the race, and then I'll meet you in New York, right? So we shook hands. He got in the car. He left, and then I went home. And in the evening, or afternoon, I think, late afternoon, I went to watch the rushes on right. Giant. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there, watching the rushes, 
when the door opens in the screening room and Elizabeth Taylor was just sitting watching the rushes suddenly goes, oh my God! I said, why is she reacting that way? The guy, she sent something from the guy who opened the door. And the guy opened the door and she said, I'm sorry, but Jimmy was just killed in a car accident. Wow. How'd you, you must have been devastated. What? You must have been devastated. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely unbelievable. How do you think his career would have gone? What? How do you think his career would have gone had he lived? Oh, I think it would have gone tremendously because he really wanted it. Yeah. Like the Russian play he was going to do with me, he wasn't just going to be a Hollywood star, you know. And um, yeah. he read a lot. And his, also, Kazan heard him too, which I was upset with Kazan about it. Yeah. Because what happened was whenever Jimmy had his motorbike, and whenever he saw Kazan, hey, and Kazan would get on the back of the motorbike and he would, yeah. Jimmy would ride him. The same way Jack Warner called Kazan and said, your actor won't get off the set. He said, we have to close the, we close the studio, but he won't leave. So please get him out. And Kazan knew Dean and he said, okay, don't worry, I'm going and I'll stay with him there, okay? Yeah. So Dean wanted to stay to feel at home, to sense that this was his place. Mm -hmm. And Kazan had the sense that he wanted to do that, so he went and stayed with him. And well, so what happened yeah. after the movie, and Dean confided in me, what happened was that he was on a motorbike and Kazan was at the studio. And he said, okay, Gatch, come on, get on the back. Kazan walked up to him and said, Jimmy, the movie's over. I can't do that. I have my work to do. Man. Let me ask you this, and we'll kind of finish with this. Um, when did you meet M Marilyn Monroe for the first time? She showed up at the actor's studio? Let me just try to be specific. Um, Yeah, you know, she came to a session of the actor's studio. Yeah. And I, I didn't even go to introduce myself to her. And that we She was already a star at the time, but oh, she yeah. wanted she oh, wanted to become star. a better actress. Oh no, yeah, right. Yeah. Big star. And yeah. so what happened was that weekend, um, she was invited to Strasbourg's Fire Island mm -hmm. house. Eli Wallach was, and so was I. And that's when I, I met her and talked to her. But it's a very funny story. So we were having lunch, and Eli was there, and Annie Jackson, his wife, mm -hmm. and Marilyn turned to Eli, uh, uh, to Eli, and she she said, "You know, Eli." What's so wonderful about you? I feel like I have a brother. And Eli said, well, Marilyn, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't feel like I have a sister. You're my sister. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I was, how old was I? I was, I think, 26, 27. You're just a punk. And so I start talking about Stanislavski and Vachtangov and all that. And then after dinner, we're in the living room, and I hear Marilyn saying, Jack, Jack, can you come in for a minute? Sure, I walk in. She's in bed under a sheet. And she says, so, what was that Russian guy's name? Uh, I don't mean Stanislavski, the other guy. Vachtangov, oh, good, tell me about him. <laughs> and she's naked under the, <laughs> under the sheet. And you, you got to know her quite well. What? You got to know her quite well. She knew me better than I knew myself. Like, after that weekend, we drove back in a car, we were, a mm -hmm. driver, we were in the back, and she turned to me and she said, 
I know why you married that woman. She didn't like Carol, you know. Yeah. I know why you married that woman. Why, Marilyn? Because, Jack, your mother wasn't there to say no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you like Marilyn a lot, but right? You liked Marilyn a very lot. Much. I felt that a lot in common in terms of how people treated us, you yeah. know. In, in in what way? You say you have a lot in common. You had a lot in common because of the way they treated you. In what way? Well, people were jealous. Yeah. And so they would do, try to destroy things and humiliate you and, you know, and didn't appreciate things that you felt you were doing out of right. your love for things. Mm -hmm. But because you, you were just a certain... And those, that's how the Kennedys, see? In those days, you married a woman who never had sex. Uh, I was a virgin. You wouldn't marry sex. Right. You know, and here was a girl who they felt fucked everybody around the block, probably. So they felt they, they could get it, too. Yeah. You know, but nothing to do with any humanity or with any concern. So. So how did you feel when you heard she died? What? How did you feel when you heard that she had died? Well, I was very upset. Like even with Kazan, there was a party at the Strasbergs, and I was standing with Patty Chayefsky, and she looked so amazing, Marilyn, that he kept Patty kept looking, and I too I looked it was great. Kazan noticed our look. He came over and he said, "You want to have that? You can have it." Uh, one time I wanted to hit him. Yeah, you were protective of her. I wasn't protecting, but I felt she was a human being who did certain things that out of a, a real love or care, and people thought she was just a whore. You know? Well, why don't we stop there yeah, and okay. maybe pick this up some other time, because uh, I know that you're tired, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a Thanksgiving we're doing this on, so we got to go have ourselves some turkey. Okay, great. And uh, Jack Garfine is my friend, and that is one of my proudest achievements in life, believe me, Jack. And Alex is my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jack Garfine, ladies and gentlemen.